Gloria McMillan's story began long before her experience on the Armis Brooks television show. Before that, there was the radio show of Armis Brooks, and also lots more radio productions. I'm Gloria's grandson, Sean Uminski. And I'm Gloria's grandson, Christopher Uminski. There's my daddy and me. And there's my mom and me. At age four, as I remember, one rainy day in Portland, Oregon, my mom, Hazel, ran outside to find me happily riding my tricycle. And she called to me, Gloria, come inside right now. I want you to listen to something on the radio. Well, she unhappily parked her beloved tricycle and went inside to find that her mom had tuned into the show, Stars of Tomorrow, on KGW Radio in Portland. As the two of them listened to the kids on the show, Hazel said, Gloria, you could do that, honey. They're having auditions soon. Wouldn't you like to be on that show? And that's how my acting career got started. I auditioned, got the job, and within a couple of weeks, there I was tap dancing and singing on the radio. I stood on a large box in front of a microphone. She loved it, and she did the show for quite some time. To make a long portion of the story short, Gloria's mom had a dream to move to Hollywood and help Gloria get into show business. She followed that dream, but Gloria remembers the sadness of leaving her dad in Oregon. He worked for the Union Pacific Railroad Company, and he immediately put in for a transfer to L.A. Gloria, her sister Janet, and their mom Hazel got off the train in the Los Angeles downtown railway terminal and literally walked the streets looking for housing. Eventually, they found their first place to live. It was a small apartment above the Grace Bowman Dance Studio near Hollywood Boulevard in Franklin. Soon, Hazel would do typing work in return for the room and so that Gloria could take tap classes. She loved to tap dance. Daddy would send us money. My mom contacted agents and producers and looked for opportunities for me to audition for radio. Oh, she was good. She got me lots of auditions, and it seemed like it was very soon after arriving in L.A. that I got my first job as a real actress. I don't remember experiencing kindergarten in Portland, but I do remember enrolling in first grade in Los Angeles at age six. Radio shows that Gloria performed on included Red Rider, The Lux Radio Theater, Date with Judy, The Jack Benny Show, the Red Skelton Show, The Phil Harris and Alice Faye Show, The Burns and Allen Show, Baby Snooks, The Great Gildersleeve, and Fibber McGee and Molly. She also did Don Amici's What's New. She played the part of Amy on the Dr. Christian radio show, and she was a regular on Mayor of the Town, starring Lionel Barrymore. Some other shows that Gloria did were Silver Theater, Star in the Story, Nobody's Children, Big Town, The Bob Burns Show, I Love a Mystery, The Elgin Christmas Program, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, and Screen Guild. Eventually, my daddy got his transfer with Union Pacific and joined Mom, me, and my sis in Los Angeles. One of my biggest thrills was when my daddy was able to see me perform for the Lux radio show. Before that, he could only listen to my shows on his radio in Portland. Shortly after his arrival in Los Angeles, tragedy struck and Gloria's dad was killed in an accident at the train yard. As her dad pulled a double shift to cover for one of his workers, a train engineer was working on a mechanical problem in the early morning hours. As the engine roared, something came apart. A large piece of metal flew and hit Gloria's dad, Emerson McMillan. He would live for several more hours. My dad told me and my sister to take good care of my mom. And shortly thereafter, he was gone. Hazel was wise, and with the insurance settlement money, $10,000, she invested all of it in a home in the small suburb of Beverly Hills, 126 North Doheny Drive. Somehow, my mom got me signed up with RATE, which stood for Radio and Television Exchange. RATE would call with audition information, and actors would show up, audition, and would get radio work in that manner. One fateful day, Hazel and Gloria responded to a rate call and went to CBS for an audition. There were a few actors there. Eve Arden, 
Jeff Chandler, Richard Crenna, Gail Gordon, and Gloria. We all sat together and read a script. We were directed by Larry Burns. After the read-through, Mr. Burns calmly said to the group of us, Okay, everybody, you are the cast of the new show, Our Miss Brooks. Well, we were all stunned and elated. The Armis Brooks radio show was an instant success. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. You're just the person I wanted to see. Good morning, Harriet. What can I do for you? It's Daddy, Miss Brooks. I'm real worried about him. Last night he cried out in his sleep several times. Mother had to keep waking him up, and, and once in his sleep he screamed out your name. My name? Yes. That's when Mother had to tie him to the bed. <laughs> I think I can explain your father's nocturnal penchant for screaming my name, Harriet. We've spent the better part of this week exchanging unpleasantries. Then Daddy did have words with you? Harriet, your Daddy had words that I wouldn't repeat in front of a sailor. <laughs> extremely nervous this morning when Walter Denton drove him to the doctor's. Well, I hope his doctor has a good doctor. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, Harriet, I'll run along to class. Just a minute, Miss Brooks. Here's Daddy now. Oh, good morning, Harriet. Well, the doctor says there's nothing wrong with me physically at all. I knew it. You look better already. Thank you, my dear. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> he just took a turn for the worse. Fred. Oh, excuse me, Miss Brooks, but I've got a wonderful lead for our new business. Really, Harriet? Who is it? My father. Your father? But you've got a moose head in your living room now. <laughs> you mean uh, he wants something stuffed? I happen to know that he caught a fish up at Crystal Lake yesterday, and he's entering it in his fishing club's annual contest this afternoon. Maybe you can sell him the idea of having it mounted. But why me? Why don't you sell him the idea? Because coming from me, the whole thing would seem like kid stuff to Daddy. But with you handling it, the whole project takes on weight. I guess this girdle has given up the ghost. <laughs> Look, Harriet, your father's a pretty tough customer, and I'm not the logical contender. You shouldn't be afraid of Daddy, Miss Brooks. His bark is much worse than his bite. I don't know about that. A bite you can have cauterized. <laughs> Please, Miss Brooks. Well, this is a great opportunity to get our business off to a flying start. Why, did he catch a flying fish? <laughs> Beast. <laughs> Say you'll take a crack at Daddy. Well, if you'll get somebody to hold him, I'll... I mean... <laughs> if you think I ought to, Harriet, I'll talk to your father. Is he having lunch in the cafeteria? No, Miss Brooks. Since he went fishing yesterday, he can't stand the sight of food. So he's taken a baked apple to his office. Now, go ahead, Miss Brooks. Beard the lion in his den. All right, Harriet. I'll try to beard the lion. But I'd feel a lot better if I'd once removed a thorn from his paw. <laughs> As the radio show grew in popularity, we all enjoyed the steady work and the notoriety. My mom, my sis, and I were experiencing some financial security. Oh, a very new feeling for us. We were all very grateful for the wonderful writing and guidance of Al Lewis, Jess Oppenheimer, and Larry Burns. And we, as an ensemble cast, also realized that Eve Arden was a pace setter, a strong leader who loved, appreciated, and guided us with her showbiz wisdom. I loved her. Then another fateful day arrived, and Larry Burns exclaimed to all of us, Well, guys, we're going to TV. It was such a great time in my life. We went to television with the same cast, <laughs> a rarity. Jeff Chandler, as Mr. Boynton, did a few TV episodes and then sadly died unexpectedly during the run. He was replaced by Robert Rockwell. Also, by this time, Janie Morgan was playing Connie Brooks's housekeeper, Mrs. Davis. We were all doing both the radio and the television show at the same time. It is very memorable to me to have worked in a studio directly next to the I Love Lucy show. 
and I also realized that the cast members of Brooks became my surrogate family, especially Eve. <laughs> Directed by Al Lewis. And presented for your pleasure by Cool Shake, the swell new mix for making thick, foamy milkshakes at home, pre cooked minute rice for perfect rice without cooking, and Jello Instant Pudding, that good, good, busy day dessert. <laughs> love letter. Mr. Levance gave it to Miss Brooks and uh, I translated it. But you can hardly understand a word of French, even after three terms. Well, that's all right. Neither can Miss Brooks. <laughs> all she knows is some Spanish she picked up from a teacher named Jose Gonzalez. So I figured it was safe to take a guess at it. A guess? Well, sure. What would a Frenchman possibly put into a note to a woman? It's got to be about l'amour toujours. Well, <laughs> that Mr. Levance does write a romantic letter. I wish I knew what it says. So do I. Here, read it. In English. Okay. Let's see, it says, um, Dear Miss Brooks, I would not have the courage to write this if Mr. Boynton had not told me that you were kind enough to loan him some money. Well, you didn't sound very romantic so far. <laughs> uh, what's your essay? Um, I have promised to buy our principal car, but due to a mortifying shortage of finances, I am wondering if you can lend me $50, but immediately. <laughs> Anxiously, Maurice LeBlanc. How do you like that guy? He's not Warner, he's biting her. <laughs> I'm just going to sharpen these pencils, Harriet, but what's new? Oh, plenty. I just found another poem that was smuggled into my history book, Miss Brooks, and I know who put it there. At last, I know who my secret admirer is. Really, Olivia? I mean, Harriet? <laughs> How did you find out? Oh, I recognized his handwriting. Every time I've seen it, I've practically swooned. At first, I couldn't believe it, but then I said to myself, why not? Men get crushes just like girls do. Sometimes worse. It's, um, it's very hard for me to tell you this, Miss Brooks. You know how I've always rooted for your romance. You've been right on the 50-yard line, Harriet. But, well, this thing is bigger than you and me, Miss Brooks. It's bigger than all of us. Well, maybe we can chop it down to size. <laughs> Whom do you think is the history book smuggler? It's, it's, uh, well, he, he's older than I am, Miss Brooks. Do you think an older man could become infatuated with a woman my age? It happens every day in the Ozarks. <laughs> now, I don't mean to tease you about this thing, Harriet, but you're a very sweet, sensitive girl, and I wouldn't like to see you hurt. As a matter of fact, the first man I had a crush on was older than I was, and because of the difference in our ages, the romance got nowhere. How old were you both? Well, as I recall, I was 14, and he was 68. <laughs> I was pretty sensible about it, though. I finally figured out that by the time I had come of age, he would have already went. <laughs> and don't quote me to my English class. Oh, now you're teasing me, Miss Brooks. And this is a very serious matter. I've got to let him know that I know who he is. Well, how are you going to do that? Oh, in a very subtle manner. I'm just going to hand back his poem to him without saying a word, and then he'll know that I know. Oh, can I borrow this envelope, Miss Brooks? I don't want to lose it before I meet him. Oh, help yourself, Harriet. Just the one my allotment of report card came in. I'll have to continue this discussion later, dear. I've got to sharpen these pencils. Oh, sure. Poor Miss Brooks. But that's life, I guess. The eternal triangle. Oh, good morning, Harriet. Have you seen Miss Brooks? Oh, Mr. Boynton. Dear Mr. Boynton. Here, Mr. Boynton. Au revoir, Mr. Boynton. Huh? Harriet, what's in this envelope? <laughs> well, a bit of bone snodgrass. 
Oh, gosh, Harriet. She's the one I wanted to see. Uh, Harriet, even though you're Walla's girl, well, uh, what I mean is, gosh, oh, Harriet, I can't help it. I just got to tell you how I feel about you, Harriet. Harriet, I think you're repugnant. <laughs> what? Yeah, I felt it right from the start. All right, there's something I want you to have. Here, take it. Hi, Harriet. Bones? Hi, oh. Walter. Hi, Walter. Well, I, I can't talk to you right now. I have to run over and deliver a message as soon as I have lunch. <laughs> Goodbye, Harriet. So long, everybody. Well, what's the matter with him? Golly, I don't know. He seems awfully mixed up. First he told me I was repugnant, and then he gave me this note. A note? Well, what does it say? Let's see. Well, I don't understand it. It says, I would like a dozen small flower pots for my window <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Excuse me, David, there's been a dreadful mistake. What are you talking about, Harriet? Why aren't you in your classroom, Denton? It was Bones' mistake, Mr. Conklin. Uh, I guess I got excited, sir. I, I... Pardon me, Mr. Conklin. What is this, a convention? <laughs> I heard you were called up on the carpet, Miss Brooks. Anything I can do? No, just cover me with it. <laughs> what is going on here? Don't you see, Daddy? Bones gave you the poem he was planning on giving me by mistake. Yeah, but he wasn't the only one that gave Harriet a poem. I did, too. I put it in her history book. What? Yeah, but it wasn't my idea, sir. Then whose idea was it? That I refuse to say. <laughs> <laughs> they take women in the Foreign Legion? I have had just about enough of this nonsense. Now clear out of my office, all of you. Now here, Bones, take this, this ridiculous poem with you. Well, it ain't mine, sir. Miss Brooks gave it to me. Here. Oh, but Mr. Boynton gave it to me, here. Well, Harriet gave it to me, here. Well, I gave it to me, here. Uh, Mr. Boynton gave it to me, here. <laughs> well, the last one to the incinerator is a bell's tongue. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. Certainly, Harriet. I put those new flash bulbs in your office for you, Daddy. Oh, thank you, Harriet. What are you doing with the egg? Uh, well, um, we were just discussing its, um, its, um... Condition? <laughs> what about its condition? Uh, well, you see, Harriet, uh, we have reason to suspect that well, there's just the barest possibility... Uh, the egg may have... Please, Miss Brooks! <laughs> Harriet is a minor. You mean she still thinks the stork brings chicken? I agree with Mr. Conklin. This is no subject for mixed company. Uh, no, no, you'd better run along, Harriet. I don't... I don't get it, Daddy. What's all the mystery about? I'll have your mother explain it to you later. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll just get some nice warm flannel and put this little prize-winning fowl to be in a snug little box on my desk. Well, all right, Daddy. Oh, before I forget, I'd like your permission to leave school a few minutes early this afternoon. I promised I'd visit Aunt Lucy. Aunt Lucy? Yes, at the Elm Street Maternity Hospital. My aunt just had another... Please, Harry. <laughs> Not in mixed company. <laughs> yes, that's far. Here's the heating unit you ordered. Oh, thanks. Harriet, we want a chicken, not a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> oh, this will be fine, Harriet. Daddy's assembling his camera equipment like mad. He seemed very surprised when I told him the egg was down here. You told Daddy? Well, there's not a minute to lose, Mr. Boynton. It's the hatchery or bus. Nothing doing. All we need is some more hot water. Victor, would you go over to the cafeteria and boil some for us? Sure. Uh, where is it? I'll show you. Just follow me. Thank you. I still think we ought to go, too, Mr. Boynton. We're going to stay right here, Miss Brooks. As a biology teacher of many years' experience, you can take my word for it. This shell is going to crack open any minute. Hey! Walter, where have you been? Well, at a time like this, I figured the mother should be here. Oh, <laughs> oh that's perfect. Mr. Boynton, now she can sit on it. She has a built-in heating unit. Oh, that is...
isn't really the egg. What? Well, no. I figured Mr. Conklin might get wind of it, so I pulled the old switcheroo again. Oh. Yeah, that's another rock. Oh. I hid the real egg. Well, where did you put the real egg? Well, uh, just tell me I'm not too late. No, not at all, Mr. Conklin. We were just going to find out who the butler killed. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I have to ask Walter a question. No, don't I... move, Miss Brooks. You have the egg. Uh, just a minute, sir. Well, don't bother me now, Boynton. Uh, Denton, get me some extra flash bulbs from my office. I may take dozens of pictures of this great event. Yeah, but, but, sir, I... On the double, boy! <laughs> Now, I'm going to forget about all past chicanery. Any fool can see that the egg you're holding so tenderly is the genuine article. Uh, but don't you think we ought to put it back in its cozy little nest? Yes. Well, it's all yours, Mr. Cox. Hogan! <laughs> <laughs> Hogan! Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton, I demand to know the whereabouts of the real egg. I will give you one minute to confess. <laughs> Miss Brooks! <laughs> Miss Brooks! Tell a lie. I did it with my little hatchery. <laughs> and eventually, we did the Our Miss Brooks movie for Warner Brothers. But I had to get my transmission fixed, and uh... you can explain later, Walter. Take your seat, please. Hi, Harriet. Now to get back to the double negative, it would be wise to remember. I just ran into your father, but fortunately he didn't see me. You see, right after I got my transmission fixed, I was rolling along fine when all of a sudden, Walter Denton. That'll be enough whispering. Yes, ma'am. I was rolling along fine when all of a sudden my drive shaft fell out. <laughs> Let's settle down, shall we? There isn't much time left in this period, and I'd like to be dismissed. It's been a pretty grueling session. What about lunching together today, Walter? Yeah, I was hoping you'd ask. Jerry Nolan. The stars desert the skies and rush to nestle in your eyes. It's magic without a golden wand or mystic charms. Fantastic things begin when you are in my arms. When we walk hand in hand... If you hand, don't stop that infernal wailing, I'll throw you down the steps! You know, of all the days to be without my car. At least we could have gone for a ride or something. Why did Mr. Boynton have to borrow it anyway? No, he said it was urgent. Said he had to drive up to Crystal Bay to see Miss Brooks. What's Miss Brooks doing at Crystal Bay? She was invited to the Nolan's boat. Uh, Gary told me about it at the track meet last night. Oh, is little Mr. High Pockets talking with us lower middle class folks these days? Well, he's a lot different than he used to be. You know, Gary's almost human once you scratch away the cashmere. Miss Brooks even has him writing sports stories for the Monitor. Not bad, either. Did I hear you say Miss Brooks is visiting the Nolan boat today? You overheard it, yes, sir. Uh, very influential person, Nolan. 
between his paper and the television station he controls, a fella could swing a lot of votes. Oh, now, Daddy, just because Miss Brooks works for Mr. Nolan, I don't think... I didn't should... ask you what you think, Harriet. Now, if you and Caruso here will vacate the couch, I'd like to stretch out and do a little thinking. The Nolan Boat, eh? Well, the day came when we all dealt with the canceling of the show. As you all know, the entire cast of actors made wonderful careers in the business. During and after the Brooks shows, I also enjoyed doing many summer stock performances, including work at the Pasadena Playhouse and the La Jolla Playhouse. I must mention that during the years after Brooks ended, my mom remained in the talent agent business until she was well into her 80s. She became a good friend of Walt Disney and was on a first-name basis. Her clients over the years included Paul Williams, Jay North, Catherine Chapin, Angela Cartwright, Bobby Burgess, and Linda Evans. Mom even continued to represent me. In 1974, a dream of mine came true. Eve called me and wondered if I'd be interested in traveling to Seattle to do a live show called under Papa's picture at the Cirque Dinner Theater. Oh, of course I was. The producer was Curtis Roberts from Los Angeles, whom we all loved. Oh, it was a wonderful experience, and Mr. Roberts is to this very day a great friend. The cast included Eve's husband, Brooks West, Chuck Howerton, Eve, and myself. We had a four-week run that was extended to eight weeks, and we loved the time together. During the next few years, I would keep my hand in professional theater. Mom suggested that I go with the Tyler Carr Agency, and I was cast in the TV series Perfect Strangers, Most Wanted, and the movie Smile with Bruce Durham, Melanie Griffith, and Barbara Feldon. Then, my wonderful friend, John Wilder, cast me in his epic television series entitled Centennial. We filmed in Greeley, Colorado. As you can see. Oh, oh. You built it yourself, Papa? Uh, every stick. And you dug the ditch yourself, too? Inch by inch. It's so big. All of it. Come on, my princess. Come on. always have, haven't we? Just then we'll have something to show for it. Cut. Yes, Papa? Come here, son. This 
is your land too, you know. And it's a mighty thing what this land is to us and what we are to this land. It's never going to be easy here. The building, the digging, the plowing, the planting, and the harvesting. But it's a mighty thing. A noble thing. Maybe the most noble thing there is after what you and I are to each other. And it can be the best thing in your life, this land. But it's got to be one. And it's got to be honored. And it's got to be defended. Now, I know I don't expect you to understand all that just now. But you think about it. Don't you ever forget I said it. And you think about it as you grow bigger. All right? Yes, Papa. Yes, Papa. Takamoto, ain't that your lunch basket? Hi, uh, lunch. Hi, well, uh, where are you going? Off. Which not any. He say we go to our garden now. Your vegetable garden? Huh. Well, don't you know that all work and no play makes Takamoto a dull boy? Ha! <clears throat> well, well, anyway. Now, you, uh, you folks can't work all the time. You gotta eat, you know. Hi. Hi, all right. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> Where's Hurt? The wagon. He'll eat in town. <laughs> now what? Oh, it's them Takamoros. They're funny people. Why? Aren't they working hard enough? Aren't they working hard enough? They're the best workers I ever hired. Better than the Germans, better than the Russians. The trouble is they work too hard. Now they're digging up their own vegetables. Sure, to sell. To what? They sell their crops in town. Make real good money. They do now. Save every penny of it, too. I saw them in the bank the other day. They were asking about land to buy. They'll be leaving you before long, just like all the others. Come on, sit down. It's cold outside. Feels like an early winter. I better get the hay in while I still have help. For over 40 years now, my husband Ron and I have owned and operated our performing arts school, the Looking Glass Studio of Performing Arts in San Bernardino, California. We have enjoyed having as many as 500 students at one time. Ron and I and our staff teach classes in ballet, tap, jazz, hip-hop, contemporary acting, vocal, and instrumental music. There are 12 of us on the staff. We have helped and encouraged many young students to pursue theater as a career. I teach acting in our in-house theater, the Hazel McMillan Studio Theater. I also teach tap classes three days a week. Ron and I produce a large-scale concert program every 18 months and are very proud of what we do. We love working with children. I totally enjoy passing on my understanding of the art of acting and tap dance to our students. I want to thank the radio enthusiasts of Puget Sound for this honor and the opportunity to share some of my career highlights. I truly love performing for reps and I love the opportunities that the organization has offered to me and Ron and our grandsons, Sean and Chris. Our love to you all.